Welcome to Banfield Manhunt for Brian Laundry. It's on land, in the water, from the air, and in cyberspace. 75 officers from more than 16 agencies were back at it again, out in that alligator infested swamp in Northport, Florida, trying everything to find Gabby Petito's fugitive fiance. Officers walking the grounds, beating the bushes, divers and swamp buggies, searching all of the ponds. Just look at the risk to those men. Drones keeping an eye on anything that moves from down below. They fly up above. The Federal Aviation Administration has even joined this hunt, restricting the airspace above the park during the search. Normally, aircraft can fly as low as 400 feet above the Carlton Reserve, but not now. Flights have to stay above 1,200 feet so that they don't interfere with the search drones. The big question, though, what kind of search is this? Is it a manhunt for a fugitive? Or is it a recovery mission for evidence or maybe a body? The Laundry family attorney, Steve Bertolino, tells News Nation's Brian Enton that Brian Laundry left his wallet and his cell phone behind at the parents' house when he allegedly drove off for that hike in the reserve on September 14th. But think about it. If the Laundries were really worried about Brian, well, they have completely ignored a massive press corps staked right outside their front door, just eager to help them search for their missing and now fugitive son. But no, nope, not a word, not once. As the manhunt intensifies, so do the memorials for the real victim in this story, Gabby Petito. Several memorials have been planned for her. Let me start you off with the one tonight. It was a light the night ceremony. It was held for Gabby tonight in her hometown, Blue Point, New York. Supporters put lanterns some call them luminaries. They put them at the end of their driveways at 7 p.m. to honor Gabby and to encourage everyone to do their part to bring her killer to justice. A candlelight vigil is set for tomorrow at City Hall in Northport, Florida. That's where she lived with the laundries. The organizers plan to release butterflies in her honor. That would be because of this final Instagram post of Gabby's. It is clear as to why they chose butterflies. A public memorial service is also planned for Gabby's home state of New York. On Sunday, the public is being invited to join Gabby's family and her friends from noon until five at a funeral home in Holbrook, New York. I think it is safe to say that it is doubtful that her once future in-laws will be attending any of those things because they're still holed up in that 1,400 square foot house in Florida, where News Nation's Brian Enton has been staked out for two weeks. And Brian's with me now live. Brian, it looks like they can run, but they sure as heck cannot hide from images of Gabby. They can't, Ashley. You mentioned it. There are these memorials popping up all over the place, and there are posters that appeared outside uh, the Laundry family home. Let me show you. Oh, wait. We got a car coming by. Let's let this car go by, and then I'm going to cross the street, Ashley, and show you. They've actually reopened the street, by the way. That's why you see a car going by. Look closely oh, wow. at this palm tree. This is a picture uh, of Gabby on this palm tree. We walk down. There's another picture of Gabby. Uh, on this palm tree right here, and then we can get really close, and you see there's someone who is leaving these laminated photos of Gabby in the laundry yard, and this one says, I was here once. Uh, I presume what that means, you know, we know Gabby was living with the laundries at one point. This is obviously a message someone uh, is trying to send to the family right here. A lot of people frustrated that they're still not cooperating, Ashley. Wow, Brian, that is bold. Those laundries, if they ever peek out those windows or that door or go to their driveway and get in their truck, they can't uh, miss it. But it's interesting, Brian. It's, you know, 10.05 Eastern time, and they have not come out to clear those away. It looks like they're probably not going to, or do we even know if they've seen them? 
I don't know that they've seen them. They haven't come out of the house today. It looks very similar uh, that it does the other days. I, I don't think there's any way that they would have seen them. And, um, you know, my photographer and I were talking today. At some point, they're going to have to mow the yard. They're going to have to come out. They're obviously trying to avoid the media. Uh, but at some point, they're going to have to come out and they're going to see these signs. So uh, they were paid a visit by about a half dozen uh, police SUVs today. We all of a sudden were in a frenzy thinking, this is it. There's action. What actually happened when all those police vehicles rolled up? We were in a frenzy, Ashley. We were just waiting, and all of a sudden, the police roll up. They had their lights on. Some of the officers went right to the front door of the laundry's house. Others went around the side to the back. We weren't sure what was going to happen next. Uh, they were only here for about 10 or 15 minutes, and then they left. And we later learned this was apparently a false alarm. Uh, according to Northport Police, there were uh, reports of gunshots. They got a call from a anonymous number to the police department saying there were gunshots. The police raced out here. There were no gunshots. It was just a false report, which, by the way, police say they're now investigating that false report. Yeah, better known as uh, SWAT, uh, swatting people. And it is very, very dangerous. And you can be in a heap of trouble if you do that. And don't think that just because you block your number, you can't be found. That's just stupid. Um, Brian, tell me a little bit about uh, the Laundry family. We've seen action in terms of them going towards the police station yesterday, heading to Orlando to see a lawyer. Has any lawyer come to see them? Because it's clear at this point their son cannot communicate with them. And if they do, they can be considered harboring a fugitive. That is dangerous. That can net you 10 years in, um, in federal prison. Yeah, we know the Laundries went yesterday to meet with their lawyer, Mr. Bertolino, in Orlando. He came in from New York. They met in Orlando. No one has come to the house today, but you mentioned at the top of your show, we were texting with Mr. Bertolino today, and he did confirm to us. He says that the parents said that when Brian left this house to go on a hike, he did not have his cell phone, he did not have his wallet, and he also said the parents were concerned that Brian was going to hurt himself. We had follow-up questions. We asked Mr. Bertolino, did Brian have a weapon? He responded, unknown. And then we asked him, uh, where is the cell phone now? Is the cell phone still in the house? Do police have the cell phone? He didn't respond to that either. Well, of course not. That would be silly to tell us what the police have in their possession. But how would they know he doesn't have a cell phone unless it's sitting in their house? And if they were so worried, why did they leave it for four days before they called the police and said, give us a hand, but never called you, never called any of the people you're standing with out there, Brian, to say, help us, help us. We're apoplectic about our, our missing son. So I take with a grain of salt anything now that, that comes from the family. Brian Enton, excellent work. Update us if anything happens throughout this hour. Brian has been just amazing, staking out all of the activities that happen outside of the laundry home. Uh, but you know something? If you're on the run, folks, from the law, you do not want our next guest hot on your heels. That's why it is terrible news for Brian Laundrie that John Walsh has set his sights on him. John, it's great to see you again. You had a show on Wednesday night on Investigation Discovery. It's in pursuit with John Walsh. You covered this story and lo and behold, as is per usual for John Walsh, the tips start pouring in. Tell me how it's going. How many and how good are they? I will. I'll tell you, Ashley, it was amazing. But I got to say one thing f to all the viewers in that area. Swatting is against the law. It's dangerous. People get killed. Whoever called 911 to send the cops there because they heard a gunshot, they're going to trace your phone. They're going to go back to you and you're going to do some time. It's a horrible thing. No you're kidding, right? right? Terrible. So, Just terrible. Let me give you an update. We had at least three times more phone calls than we've had on any fugitive. This is the third season of In Pursuit. We've caught 26 wow. guys. We've recovered eight missing kids. So people are watching the show. It's amazing. Um, and many people said they saw you and I together for a couple nights and said, you know, I watched and I, I got off the couch and, and I'm looking at this list here. We got about 500 tips and from everywhere. People thought that they'd spotted him in Portugal. You know, the world's a smaller place and I've caught 
the 1,422 guys I caught, they were, some of them I caught in different, the craziest places, 45 countries. So people hmm. texted us or called in from all over, Portugal, all over. People were talking about Cuba. But the, vet, the good tips, 15 tips we had was what I had said, that the dirty laundry, dirty laundry mom and dad and the Johnny Cochran lawyer that you talk about, Stephen Bertolino, who I hope is he knows he's going to burn in hell for hiding all this stuff and giving all kinds of red herring tips to the police. He's the mouthpiece. And I know about client privilege and Fifth Amendment. I've been doing this for a whole long time. But boy, he knows a lot that he's not talking about. But anyways, many of the tips were my theory that they somehow, you know, when he got home from the trip and he didn't say anything to anybody for 10 days, this is not, and I know your lawyers are nervous. This is John Walsh's opinion has been doing this and caught 1,422 of uncatchable guys that the cops could never catch. So I got a little bit of experience, but I, when they got, when he got home, they scrubbed the van, he and his family, the dirty laundries, and I'm sure the FBI didn't find anything in the house. And during that time, they planned how to get him out. So daddy bought a camper top, a little white camper top. It's still in the driveway. And the neighbors who really only said it the other day, I was waiting in line and, on Fox News to talk to Martha McCallum and the neighbors walk out and say, you know, we were so surprised that, you know, about three days before Gabby's parents filed the missing persons report, three or four days, they didn't remember how, when it was exactly, that the Brian and the father put the camper top on the red pickup truck, pa packed. And off they went. Uh, and, and, yeah, and they off, they, off they went, strangely enough, on September 11th, the day that, you know, Gabby was reported missing. John, let me ask you something real interesting about a development today. Brian Enton just reported that this woman drove 60 miles to the laundry house. She doesn't know them. She didn't know Brian. She didn't know Gabby. But she came to knock that stake with those pictures of Gabby saying, I once lived here. And I think what's so critical about this, how this ties to you, is that these are people who care. They're the people who pick up the phone and they call you. They're the people who check their ring cameras. They're the people who check their drive cameras. And are you getting people like that who just feel an emotional connection to the story? Huge. We haven't had this much attention since Elizabeth Smart. And when the FBI wow. gave up and told the Smarts that she was dead in the desert and they should have a memorial, I never gave up. I profiled her 17 times and a couple in Sandy, Utah spotted her with the description I gave of the guy that took her. But it is people, so I, I wanna finish about the leads. I believe that when they took, get left off in the pif pickup truck, they went Northwest over the panhandle of Florida. And then Steve Berlino gets in it on Tuesday and says he's out in the desert and there were, I mean, in the swamp and they're worried and they found his car. How did they find his car in a 60,000 acre swamp? And we left a message, Brian, if you're killing yourself or thinking about it and you're hurt. And then they said, oh, and we went back on Thursday and we got the car. And then Bertolino didn't call the Friday. So I think they bought this guy nine days. He had a big head start. So I say, now with all the chaos at the border, I caught 45 guys in Mexico. They drove them north over the panhandle, wherever they, you know, a little trip across Louisiana and Alabama, first then Louisiana. With all the chaos on the border, border he could have walked with a monkey suit on across you can walk into mexico there are no no uh border patrol of Mex mexican border patrol or customs or anything like that in most of the border so we got a lot of tips we got 15 tips that people had spotted them and then that picture shows up in mexico at a restaurant i'm pretty sure that's not him but i i believe he was, you know, after after the camper trip, he was never there. And Bertolino kept feeding yeah. the cops bullshit like he did today about the wallet and all the crap. So well, let, let me, me tell you. Let okay, quickly, finish. I got to fit in a break, though. I got to fit in a break. Um, okay, just wrap this one up and I'll fit in a break. And I want to ask you about Bertolino, something new that's uh, arrived. Okay, I got a couple. I got a tip today from Freeport in the Bahamas. And a lady there believes she spotted him. And she thinks that he, she said, there's never a white guy looked exactly like this guy walking in our neighborhood. You can take a ferry from Fort Lauderdale to the Bahamas, and all you have to do is have your vac you know, have have a vaccine proof that you did you don't have COVID, show your passport, and then you get on boats. 
of the, the B used to be days guys used to go down to St. Thomas because American protectorate. So these lady in the Bahamas in Freeport says, I swear I saw him. And I thought, oh boy, if he got on a boat somewhere, they paid somebody off, then he's going to be hard to find. But the other great tips were Appalachian Trail. One of Gabby's friends called this afternoon and said, I don't know why the cops don't know this. I told him that he, that Brian brags about how he lived on the Appalachian Trail for three months wow. in a tent and out of his backpack. So we got 10 tips from the Appalachia Trail. It's northwestern corner, panhandle corner of Florida, possibly into Mexico, Appalachian Trail. And I hope he doesn't get on those, I got on a boat in Freeport somewhere. They paid somebody to take him to another island. I used to work in the Bahamas. I was a hotel builder. So we've got some well, wonderful- those are those are fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Okay, I'm going to fit in a break. After the break, I'm going to I'm going to read something for our viewers. It's a statement from uh, the Laundry's lawyer, and it said about that arrest warrant. It said it's related to activities occurring after the death of Gabby Petito. Wait a minute, how on earth would the Laundry's lawyer know when Gabby Petito died? Because no one else knows. Maybe the police, maybe the coroner, but certainly not an innocent person who had nothing to do with it. When we come back, we are drilling down on that statement and what it means. We're going to have more about John Walsh's plan to catch Brian Laundry and get justice for Gabby Petito when we return. You know, these are images that will be seared in a lot of people's minds. This is um, Gabby's hometown. That's Blue Point, New York, where um, a student asked the uh, superintendent if maybe she could send out a note to the school district saying, I think everybody should put some luminaries and lanterns in their driveway uh, to highlight this young woman's life and make sure we find her killer. So there you go. That's Gabby's hometown. Um, Still with me tonight is is John Walsh, and as I bring John Walsh back, I also want to you know welcome you if you're new to our program. Thank you for being a part of this conversation. You can also find me on um, Twitter and Instagram and TikTok and Facebook, um, a whole bunch of you know platforms. It's TV Ashley or Ashley Banfield. Pretty simple. Um, John Walsh, I, I can't believe my eyes when I looked at this statement from Stephen Bertolino, who is the lawyer for the Laundry family. At first glance. I was a bit annoyed by it because it felt a bit heartless. It said when, you know, the arrest warrant went out for Brian Laundry, this came out and it said, it's my understanding that the arrest warrant for Brian Laundry is related to activities occurring after the death of Gabby Petito and it's not related to her actual demise. Well, I thought that was heartless and it was tone deaf. Um, but then I realized, wait a minute, it's, it's a lot more than that. How on earth could Stephen Bertolino or the Laundry family know when Gabby Petito died, because none of us knows when Gabby Petito died. I, I haven't heard it. The police haven't said anything. It is not public. I don't know that the coroner knows it. I don't know at all whether we will ever know the time of death. So I am astounded that he seems to think this arrest warrant is relating to August 30th and September 1st, that period of time, and it's after Gabby's demise. What on earth does this tell you? It tells me what I've been saying to you for the whole week and everybody else. There's a special place in hell for Stephen Bertolino. He's doing the Johnny Cochran, O.J. Simpson, I'm going to get this kid off and get my 15 seconds of fame. He's been colluding with the family. Now, this is all my own opinion. So when it comes time to get him for doing this and given all these red herrings and sending these cops into the swamp to waste hundreds of thousands of dollars, he's going to say, I didn't know what would happen. It's lawyer client privilege. But he knew that kid was gone. He knew that kid was out there. And of course, he left his wallet because his fa family gave him cash. You don't take your wallet with you when you're on the run. They bought him burner phones so they can't ping off the towers. He's got plenty, two or three cell phones somewhere. They got him supplies and they gave him a bunch of cash. And the lawyer knows that and he'll swear, oh, you can't arrest me for aiding and abetting. The dirty laundry laundries, father and mother, they know exactly what went on and they drove that kid somewhere where he could run. And that lawyer but got on the phone is, last Friday and lied. To me. 
lied to this the police. This is evidence, right? Like, this is evidence. A lawyer's statement that says these charges for bank fraud that pertain to allegedly, you know, uh, Brian Laundry using Gabby Petito's uh, ATM card, and we don't know if it's hers or not, but it sure sounds like it because he had the, the pin, according to the feds. How on earth would the lawyer for the laundries know anything about the time of death. I mean, honestly, I would be right now, if I were in the federal office of the FBI in Denver, I would be laminating the statement from the lawyer saying that this happened after Gabby's death. How on earth would the laundries know when Gabby died? How? They're the dirty laundries and they, I, I just can't believe how they hey, pulled off so many red herrings. The kid got away. He got away. Matt, let's give them the benefit of the doubt that they took him somewhere before Gabby's parents filed a missing persons report. And they scrubbed everything and they gave him everything he needed to stay on the run. They know where they let him off. And this lawyer knows that he's dealing with a dirty guy, but he's going to say this, and you're a lawyer and a good, you were a good one, Ashley. He's going to say, well, everybody has to have a defense. Well, I don't know how he can sleep at night because this is a beautiful girl. This is maybe a hundred pounds, a battered woman, a domestic abuse victim. Those cops could have saved her life. You're showing that video. And it, it's so sad. They're beautiful family. They, she lived in the house. How could these people not call her family and say, we're gonna do everything to help you find her when she was missing until they found the body? When people clam up and they don't talk to the media, they don't talk to the cops, it puts one big old mark on their head, guilty. Now with this warrant, this is fantastic because now any federal, state or local cop can look for this guy and put the collar on him. It's not just the FBI. And the FBI needs time to build this case. I talked to the stepfather's friends yesterday and they said, you know, we're out here, we're gonna bring Gabby home. And I said, listen, let that forensic pathologist, don't worry if it takes him three or four days. He will be the get key. It right. There's yep, no real get it right, you know. Jerry, you you want to preserve right. the prosecution. What you yeah. know, we've still got a long way to go in this story, right? We're going to hopefully find him. Then we're hopefully going to see some uh, charges that are apropos of what's happened, and then there may be a plea or, or a trial. So every piece of material that ends up in an evidence lockup has to be really pristine. John, I'm going to jump to break real quickly, but I just wanted to let you know you just mentioned hundreds of thousands of dollars for the search. Well, now we have. Uh, some math that shows it's actually $200,000 per day. And we have now been at this in that swamp for a week. So if you do the math, we are upwards of $1.2 million by estimates of someone in law enforcement who has said, this is going to be a costly bill if it's a red herring. When we come back after the break, we're gonna dig into that, what the possibilities are the parents could face that bill or charges, and then also, who might be helping Brian Laundry? Can he really, really do this on his own? That's next. Welcome back. You know, um, the math on this one really stings because the Daily Mail had an expert in law enforcement actually uh, figure out the cost of the search for Brian Laundry in that Florida swamp that is now going on a full week. And they came up with $200,000 per day for all of those officers and agencies to do this every day, looking for a guy who may or may not be there because we're really going off the word of his parents who just didn't tell us for four days that he was out there. But here we are, searching, searching, paying, paying. John Walsh, eventually someone who even knows the outdoors well, is going to have to get some help because he's got likely uh, not much money and it will run out. And winter is coming, sorry for that silly line, but eventually that is going to happen. And at some point he's going to need some food, some shelter, and maybe some uh, additional clothing. Well, I, I've done some fugitives that were dumber than Brian. I mean, he, he and his family, the dirty laundries, so, you know, they've, they've outsmarted police and he's got away and all that stuff. Um, I've had guys stay out there for years. You know, if he makes it to Mexico, he can head through South America. He can sell drugs. You know, he can do a whole ton of things. I caught guys that were running, you know, parasailing stuff on the, you know, on the west coast of Mexico. So sometimes losers like him can stay out there longer than you ever realized. And they'll pick mm. up a 
out somewhere. But, you know, I, I want to remind people, you know, I caught 42 guys in Mexico and I have Spanish speaking operators. People from Mexico don't want to get involved with American cops. So they call me all the time. There's lots of fans of my work in Mexico over the years. They're good, good people. They don't want an American dirtbag murderer down there. You know, he's a domestic abuser and, you know, but yeah. I, I, if they, if they, you know, I did a case uh, two years ago on In Pursuit where a guy killed his, he was a terrible domestic abuser, got divorced, and he killed his ex-wife in front of their two, four, and six-year-old kids because the mother, his mother set up that meeting so he could get even. She's doing five years in federal prison. I pushed the U.S. attorney a little bit and I said, it's got to be fair. There has to be some justice. It took, the the marshals were looking for him for five years. I caught him in three days in Mexico, again, because of wonderful people in Mexico, et cetera. I'm putting but my money on you for this one, John. I'm putting my money on you for this one. But I do want to say, I do want to ask you this, because there's a good chance at some point, uh, Brian Laundry may be watching TV in the diner that he might be in or at the gas station or wherever he might be. If you had a chance to say something to Brian Laundry, what would you tell him? I would say, turn yourself in. Do two things, Brian. Turn yourself in, but you won't. You're a coward. Now you're facing the death penalty. Um, you, you, you brutalize this girl. You're, you're a real big guy, you 90 pound woman. You brutalized her, broke everybody's heart. So either turn yourself in before the cops shoot it out and kill you when they catch you, or and spare this family the torture or kill yourself. Do the right thing, Brian. In your whole life, you've never done anything brave. You're just a coward. So go out there in the woods somewhere, but at least so we know where your body is, so the dirty laundry mom and dad can bury you somewhere, because I know what it's like not to have a body to bury. All I got well, found, they found of Adam's of remains was his severed head. So turn yourself, I don't, I mean, Kill yourself somewhere and spare this family from a horrible trial. Ashley, you know how horrible the trials are. Parents sit in the courtroom and they show pictures of your children in the, you know, partially decomposed out in the desert. It, they're, they're torture and the families want to be there. So, Brian, the right thing for you to do is go somewhere and off yourself and save everybody a lot of trouble. And when they catch you, don't forget, buddy, you made a huge mistake. Wyoming's a death penalty state. I told your lawyer, bring him in. He won't have to face the death penalty. He can make a deal. This guy's given the parents the bad, bad advice the whole way through. Because when they catch him, he's either going to get killed by the cops when they take him because he's a coward. I say kill yourself now and save people lots of money. And they ought to take whatever assets the laundry, ha ha the laundry family has and whatever that lawyer has, because I'm going to push, he's aiding and abetting. He knows everything about this case. It's way past my lawyer private uh, client privilege. And, and take his assets and, and, and put it back into the funds to look for, he's not in that swamp, Ashley. Everybody in America knows that. He's not in that Very swamp. Very frustrating to see all that work and all that money. But John, it's great the work you're doing, that you're getting all these tips, that you're getting all these viewers to check their devices and see if there's an image. And I can't tell you how much I've appreciated all you've done for this program this week. I'm gonna give you a plug. Uh, John Walsh is on Wednesday nights. It's called In Pursuit on Investigation Discovery, but it also, is streaming so you can catch John Walsh. Thank you, John. You don't have to thank me. You used to work for me and you were one of my best reporters. You're a really solid citizen. It's wonderful the way you're covering this and the way you're helping the victims out. Thank you. I'm glad to be on your show. Thanks, John. It's good to see you as always. Okay, I want to switch gears for a moment and I want you to think about uh, this during the break. How many times did you appear on camera today? None? That means that you were nowhere near um, traffic, ATMs, ring doorbells, dash cams, toll booths, and about 20 different selfies that were probably taken with you in the background. Brian Laundrie has to be worried about that. Good. Here is something that might freak you out. I bet that I could pinpoint your entire trip home from work tonight. And I am sorry if that is creepy, but it is true. Between city traffic cams, dash cams, toll cams, ring.com, neighborhood cams, selfies galore, and your own vehicle's GPS, yes, your vehicle probably can be tracked. Everything you've done, everywhere you've driven. You have left quite the popcorn trail. And that is not necessarily a bad thing, especially if you think about tracking Brian Laundry. The truth is law enforcement has a lot more to work with nowadays. 
without even leaving their laptops. And if Brian Laundrie is camping under a rock, his digital footprint may still be catching up with him. Joining us now to break down what investigators might already have on laundry is private detective and former New York City police investigator, Tom Ruskin. He's the president of CMP Protective and Investigative Group. Tom, it's great to see you. You're one of the first people I thought of when I realized just how much of a popcorn trail Brian Laundrie may have already left behind that he might not even know about. Talk to me a little bit about what police are doing these days to find us. What, what police are doing is they are able to go to neighborhoods where crimes are committed, in this case, cellular information that they potentially could track. Plus, they're asking for the help of the public. It's amazing how many videos have surfaced. A woman driving along Grand Teton National Park, filming the road that she's filming on, catching his van or their van or Gabby's van on the side of the road with the door potentially open and closing. It's incredible what police and law enforcement can now get, as you call it, on the popcorn trail. Yeah, like I know that Gabby Petito um, was seen at some point in some of her social media videos wearing what I wear every day, um, an Apple Watch. And if you have one of the better ones, it can actually tell you if your heart is slowing down and if you're in trouble. It can ping you and say, are you okay? And if you don't answer, it can actually come to the rescue, but your Apple Watch can, might even be able to, to determine a time of death. So there she is with the pink Apple Watch. And I think it's hard to tell, but I think she's got the dot on the little wheel that indicates it's one of the more, um, you know, more recent models, which could give us some indicators and help in a timeline in her prosecution. Not only will it help police possibly, depending on how her watch was set up, if the apps were activated at the time, but it potentially could give us more information. It basically could match cell sites and tracking not only in Brian's phone, but of Gabby's phone and what times they were in certain areas of the park. Now, Grand, uh, the Teton Park has cellular blackout areas and they were in an undeveloped camping area, which may hamper that type of sophistication. But police now have her watch and can potentially forensically go through it to determine information that exists in her watch. Hopefully uh, she has her watch. Here's the other thing is that that Alexa device that we all love because it'll tell us, you know, it'll help you with your kid's homework and find the, the, the date the Constitution you know, came together. Uh, it also records what you say. And sometimes it's triggered even when you don't want it to be triggered. And I think a lot of people don't understand that some of that stuff, it stays in a cache. You actually have to go in there and delete it yourself, and most people don't realize that. So when police go in on those raids, like they did at the laundry house, the 24 officers in a 1,400-square house, are they grabbing all of these devices and then just combing them with, like, really, uh, you know, particular expertise? They, they exactly did exactly as you're saying, Ashley. They took all the computer or forensic data and devices that existed, not to mention probably Mr. and Ms. Mrs. Landry's phone as well. They also probably, when they took the cars, they took the GPS and the computers out of the car, which gives them a lot of information. Now, when they traveled, as John was referring to, John Walsh, who just appeared on your show, was referring to when they traveled, plate readers, other devices picked up exactly where the car went, when it went, not to mention the pinging of their phones on cell towers as they went along the, the, the belt uh, in Florida. What I also find fascinating, you, um, you have enlightened me as to, you know, hitting a Wi-Fi when you go into a, you know, an establishment and you decide to pick up their Wi-Fi, that leaves a trail behind. So if he's gone anywhere and popped onto some Wi-Fi, um, we can know about that. We can trace where he's been based on, you know, hooking up to, to Wi-Fi and then eventually leaving. That's pretty miraculous. 
I would reasonably assume that police are trying to monitor not only any device he may have picked up, even a Go phone or something like that. They're monitoring different things at this point in time, which basically I don't want to go into because I don't want to sort of reveal what police or the FBI may be doing to catch this guy who may be guilty of murder. But at this point in time, law enforcement is using every device available to them to potentially catch him. And Tom, how amazing is it for police that so many people now have their own personal dash cams? Many people want it for their, you know, insurance or if they get in an accident, you know. But nowadays, there are just so many people who are capturing so much out on the street themselves. This must be a boon to investigators. It's a, it's, a, it's a big boon for investigators. It basically has helped solve the majority of crimes that are committed without the known uh, suspect uh, known to police. So basically what police are able to do is, that, as you alluded to before, they're able to go out and get ring cameras. They're ask, able to ask for videos. Everyone is shooting all the time on their phones. They're taking selfies. All that data is captured and people look back on their phone in the next couple of weeks as they see the story developing and they'll look back and they'll say, oh my God, that could be him. The same way the guy captured a, a person who looked like Brian Laundry walking by the side of the street a days that he supposedly disappeared. I mean, the list is so miraculous if you think about it. Alexa, Apple Watch, Ring.com, GPS, OnStar, dash cam, cell phones, laptops, business and home surveillance, traffic cameras, toll cameras, license plate readers, ATM cameras, credit card history. And i that's just kind of off the top of my head. So uh, let's hope that he's just not smart enough to realize, smile, you're on Candid Digital something. Tom Ruskin, it's good to see you, my friend. Thank you for doing this tonight. Ashley, thanks again. When we come back, Alexa, are you recording everything I say? And is that legal? You are going to be surprised at the answer to that and a bunch of other things that are legal too. That's next. Privacy is all the rage these days. You know, back off my data, steer clear my passwords, and basically don't tread on me. Well, uh, when it comes to catching a guy like Brian Laundry, um, who is now wanted by the FBI, it is kind of nice that his privacy doesn't mean a whole lot. He probably doesn't even know what kind of a popcorn trail that he's been leaving in bites while he's been on the run. Joining me now is former federal prosecutor Lise Wheel. She is the author of The Hunt for the Unabomber. She's also an excellent attorney. Lise, you know, it's so funny because I think about all the things that we assume, you know, hands off, you can never get into my, uh, my devices and my Alexa and all my business. And the truth is, once there's a charge and there's a warrant for your arrest, you can say goodbye to most of that, right? If not all of it. A hundred percent. There's a federal arrest warrant out for this guy, and that means they can use FBI and, and all police of, of law enforcement can use whatever utility, whatever they have in their, their uh, bandwidth to use. They can use it and use it hard. Uh, remember, he's, this is, he's, he's fleeing. So there's a consciousness of guilt there, we call it in the law, which, and you can use that in court, by the way, as well. Um, think when Scott Peterson, you know, dyed his hair blonde and, and took off to Mexico after his wife, Lacey Peterson, was found dead. And that, of course, raised everybody's suspicion about Scott Peterson. So yes, uh, they can use anything they want, anything they have, and they should, Ashley, they should use all of those things to get this guy. So here's something strange, though, when they all live together in a 1,400 square foot house, and let's say there's an Alexa or two, well, the feds have gone in there and come out with boxes and boxes, but what if that is the parent's uh, device and, and they're using it to, you know, dig into the conversations with Brian? Don't they have privacy rights or an expectation of privacy in their home? No, no actually, it doesn't matter because... If he's on that, right, if there's, if there's Alexis, if there's taping, if there's anything that his voice is coming through or they're talking about him. Remember, the parents could be implicated in this as well as accessories, as, you know, helping somebody who's running from the law. I mean, there's so many different charges that could be levied against them. 
that absolutely their privacy now is gone. They have no right to privacy because anything in that house um, could be related to Brian and the law enforcement has a 100% right to go in and get that stuff. That's their job. And that's a picture of his room and this is their backyard pool with the cage over the top, which is kind of normal in Florida. Um, Lise, we just were looking at pictures earlier as well of that search. And, you know, we're starting to hear what it might be costing. $200,000 a day. We're into a week now, which could be $1.2 million. What are the chances that the laundries could be stuck with that bill? Of course. I mean, if there's if it comes to a prosecution and he's found guilty, then on the civil side, I'm still talk, talking criminal, criminal civil side, on, on that side for the U.S. Attorney's Office, they're going to levy, levy fines. They're going to levy, you know, costs. All of that's going to come down to the laundries. And you know what? If I were prosecuting this case, I would use that to try to get the parents to talk. I'm not sure it would work because, you know, obviously they're trying to, you know, not obviously, but looks like they're trying to protect their son. So they may not, that may not mean anything to them, but yes, all of the tools, all of the arsenal that law enforcement has needs to be used now. And that means no expectation of privacy for anyone that was involved. And it looks very, you know, clearly here that the parents were involved in some way, in some capacity. You know, the fact that he goes off allegedly in this Mustang and for a hike and they go pick up the Mustang and bring the Mustang back after he's been gone for a while, but then don't report him, you know, as missing for several days. I mean, what parent does that unless they know that the, the Mustangs, he's never coming back to that Mustang, and it's not because he's it's, dead, it's yeah. because he's on the run. It sure is suspicious. At least it is great to see you. I missed you, so you're going to have to come on the show a whole lot more. Thank you for doing this tonight. Great to see you. Okay, so a couple things I just want to let you know about. Um, there are more memorials scheduled for Gabby Petito in the next couple of days. Tomorrow, there's a, a candlelight vigil um, in Northport at the City Hall. They're going to do a butterfly release. And then Sunday is the visitation. I'm going to leave you with some pictures of the vigil tonight that took place in Blue Point, New York. That was Gabby's hometown. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. We'll see you again on Monday.